first off, thanks for coming on here, Logan. Really appreciate it. Thanks for having me on. Looking forward to this. Yes, of course. So, yeah, what exactly is it that you do? Can we start this off by you giving a little bit about your YouTube channel and anything else about yourself? Yeah, I'm still trying to figure it out, honestly. <laughs> you know, that's that's the the big question. What do you do? Um, I would say that, you know, first and foremost, um, I feel like I'm here to help people along the journey of awakening, specifically coming out of any kind of system of religion or fundamentalism where they feel like uh, there's separation between them and God and that they have to outsource their power through some kind of external mediator in order to experience the divine within in order to experience awakening or any kind of inner transformation. And so I feel like it's my calling to walk with people out of that matrix, we could say, into liberation, because that is my story. That is my personal experience as someone who was born into a system of strict fundamentalism. And I was in that system for uh, 20 plus years. And I thought I was going to be doing that for the rest of my life. I went to college. I went to Oral Roberts University, which is one of the largest even evangelical universities in America. Um, went through a pastoral internship. Uh, I worked at a church. Uh, and, and like I said, I, I thought that this was going to be my career. But I actually started questioning everything I was taught while I was in college, while I was at Oral Roberts. And that that's what eventually led me to having an awakening. And after the awakening, I fell in love with writing. And so I started writing some poetry and some blogs, you know, short writings here and there. And then eventually I uh, would write my, my book, uh, my first book, The Mystery in You, which is a, a book on Christian mysticism, because that was kind of the, the, stepping stone for me in between coming out of fundamentalism and then eventually into uh, awakening into what I'm into now, it was Christian mysticism. So that's kind of what the book is about. Um, but yeah, I, I think to sum it up, um, I'm a spiritual coach. So I work with people. I write books. Uh, I have the YouTube channel, which has a lot uh, with there's there's so many different things I'm talking about right now, so I couldn't even tell you you know one specific area that I'm focusing on, but I am walking people through deconstruction, deprogramming, unlearning, to where they get to a place where they say, okay, I know nothing, and that's a scary place to be, mm -hmm. where you walk away from all these different belief structures and uh, all these different egoic constructs that have been built up over the years. So you get to this place of like nothingness and people don't want to go to that place because like I said, it's stepping into the mystery. It's stepping into uncertainty. And then when they're there, I don't try to give them a new philosophy or a new doctrine or some kind of new dogma for them to believe in. When they're, when they're at that place, I say, okay, now I'm going to give you a method. It's called meditation. And through meditation, you will experience the truth within yourself for yourself. And then that's where they can really start the journey. And that's where it gets fun. That's where the magic starts to happen. Mm -hmm. That's where the magic starts, <laughs> for sure. Yeah. Well, that's awesome. Um, so uh, I have so many different paths right now that's going through my head of where we can take this. What do you say is the difference in how you see Jesus or all the other sages now than before when you were in the evangelical route? You know, what's the difference maybe that you see within yourself, most importantly, that you could describe to us? Yeah, so... I would say that when I was an evangelical, my main focus was putting Christ first place in my life. So that was what we could call dedication. But after my awakening, I realized that in 
don't hear what I'm not saying. And I, I know that you probably are going to understand this, but I don't know about all your viewers. After my awakening, it went from Christ being number one in my life, like he was on some pedestal yeah. or someone that I was worshiping, to a realization that I am the Christ. Now, the Christ, I, I, I take Jesus and Christ to be two different things. Jesus yeah. of Nazareth, I, I believe, was a man, a Jewish mystic who came to self-realization probably at a young age. And I think that he had some kind of experience of what we would call Samadhi or Satori or, or divine union. And he didn't know what to do with it. And I think that's why we have the missing years of Jesus, right? Which no one really knows. Well, in the, in the fundamentalist circles, they, they don't really talk a lot about the potential scenarios, the possibilities of what Jesus could have been doing in those missing years. But I think that he had the experience, like I said, when he was younger, he didn't have anyone in his tradition that he could share this experience with because they would have all thought that, number one, it was blasphemous. So he would have been rejected. He would have been told who knows what. And so I think he went to the East, to India, to Tibet, to learn from some of the sages and yogis and gurus over there so that he could understand what he had experienced, which was obviously cosmic consciousness, oneness. Um, and so, again, I think he was a man um, who lived in the first century, who had this experience. I think he went to the East to learn more about it. And then he comes back and it's very evident in his teachings, in the canonical gospels and in some of the non-canonical gospels, like the gospel of Thomas, it's very evident that he was coming from this place of non-duality and that his words are full of mysticism and they're full of uh, transformation. And you can tell, you know, when he's, when he's talking with his audience, which is mainly uh, people who were a part of Judaism in the first century, he's speaking in a way that's almost like, you know, in between, uh, duality or separation consciousness and full-on oneness yeah. right because he could he couldn't go full-on oneness with uh people that were coming from the ego or from separation consciousness they would have never understood what he was saying so he had to bridge the gap with this language of i am in you you are in me father is in me we are one. like what does that actually mean if you really sit with that and think okay what does that mean if I am in you, you are in me, we are in the Father, the Father is in us? That's that that happy medium way of saying everything is one, right? That's the stepping stone. Yeah. And I and I even think Jesus using that word father uh to point to God was was a way to bring a relational aspect to God because again, for Jesus' audience, God was something that was distant. That was separate from them mm -hmm. and so just by adding that that title that name of the father that's bridging the gap and then he tells his disciples you know he says hey uh if any of you wants to really follow me you have to deny yourself now what self is he talking about he's talking about the false self he's talking about the ego because as long as you're operating from egoic consciousness you will never understand the hidden mysteries and the deeper teachings. And that's why I think in Matthew, it talks about Jesus had his public teachings and then the secret teachings and the secret teachings of Jesus, which is where Jesus really goes into the truth of who we are is found in the gospel of Thomas. And he literally tells his uh, disciples this very, very plainly, very clearly. And, and saying three of the gospel of Thomas, when he says, when you know yourselves, then you will be known and you will realize that you are children of God. In other words, you will realize that you are divine and that everything is one, everything is in, inter, interconnected. So, um, yeah, during that, during that phase, during that season of my journey, when I was really getting into Christian mysticism heavily, that's when my whole perception of Jesus and what the Christ even means started to change and it's evident, even in some of the writings of Paul, you know, when Paul says things like in Colossians that Christ is all and in all, he's obviously not talking about Jesus of Nazareth, the first century 
man, it just doesn't make sense. No, he's talking about something so much greater, something so much more mystical, mystical, something, something cosmic. And the Christ is our true nature. It's another word, I think, for um, self-realization or awakening. It's similar to like, you know, uh, Siddhartha Gautama became the Buddha, right? When he had his awakening experience. Jesus of Nazareth became the Christ when, which by the way, those titles like the Christ, those are titles given to Jesus by his followers. Jesus never said, I am the Christ. He confirmed it when, when people would say that to him, but he never preached about it. He never made that the point because as you know, someone that's enlightened, someone that's realized doesn't put all the attention on their separate self. Right. They always point it away and, and bring you beyond the ego. And so, yes, growing up, Christ, Jesus some, was someone I worshiped. I, I, I prayed to, I pedestalized. That was dedication. But after awakening, after self realization, I realized that I am the Christ or I'm one with Christ. And that is what has led to transformation. So, you see the difference there? Dedication, Definitely. then transformation. Mm -hmm. so, big difference yeah very well said that's um i couldn't have put it any better myself man it's rather than idolizing something outside of you it's bringing that worship and idolization within yeah it's that simple yeah 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 it's just and it's funny because you say it's quite evident when you read scripture that he's pointing to that but it's not to the dogmatic mind, you know? It's yeah. actually like, it can be a detriment if you read it in the wrong way. So it's all about finding this self-evidence within first and then approaching the gospel. And it makes so much more sense. And um, you could see really what Jesus was saying, but you have to find it within first for yourself, by yourself. And that is the tricky part. That's the hard part. Yeah. Um, yeah. How did you come to see this? You know, was there something that, what was the spark that ignited the fire within you to be able to see the light of your own truth? Yeah. Well, when I was walking away from uh, my fundamentalist upbringing and I was like changing my mind about everything I once believed to be true, um, that was one of the most challenging seasons of my life. And so when you go through any kind of deconstruction, with beliefs, whether it can be any area of life, but especially with religion, because with religion, you know, our beliefs about God and the afterlife and who we are and who like the future of humanity, all these, like these big questions, um, they become a part of who we are in a way. And so I felt like when I was letting go of all these different beliefs that I had, I felt like I was losing a part of myself. I felt like I was going through some kind of death. Mm -hmm. And so when I got to the place of, I mean, when I literally, I, I, I was questioning everything, the whole system. It started with these specific doctrines, maybe like this place of eternal torment called hell in the afterlife. And then I started questioning like, the doctrine of original sin and, and some of the stuff with the end times, that's where it started. But then it led, led to me questioning the entire narrative that we're presented that has to do with like, oh, you know, you, we're all sinners. And because of this one sacrifice through Jesus, now we can all be forgiven and now we can all go to heaven if we fill in the blank, you know, accept Jesus into your heart, get baptized, say a prayer. It just depends on which denomination we're talking about because there's so many different salvific methods and formulas and they're all claiming to have the one and only you know so <laughs> yeah. so um yeah stepping away from that i felt like i was losing my identity which in reality that my the ego my ego had had formed my sense of self from my religious beliefs and so when i let go of that and i was at this place of rock bottom i was devastated i was scared I was alone. I lost many friends. I was rejected by my previous spiritual community, which was my entire life. Um, in that place, I had a mystical experience because, and this was one of the first mystical experiences um, 
I have ever had. I, I had a few, believe it or not, growing up, especially when I was a kid, but I didn't know what was going on. I didn't know what to make of it. And I kind of just disregarded it. But this was the first one that I was really aware of. And it was almost like, I don't know. I, I think because of the suffering, because of the challenges I'd faced, I was forced to go within. Mm -hmm. I was forced to go in the last place I wanted to go. And through the darkness, I found the light that was always within me. It was always there. And after this experience, what I realized was that everything that I've been searching for externally, whether it was in some kind of deity who I thought was up in heaven or in some kind of holy book, the answer, the solution I had been looking for has always been within me. And at that moment, um, it was literally like I experienced some kind of inner transformation. But then from that point, that inner transformation completely changed the way I was seeing everything. And so it, it literally felt like I had stepped out of the matrix <laughs> and I'd entered, entered into a brand new world. And, you know, once that happens, um, things just change. You have heightened awareness, you have an expansion of consciousness. And so you start to pick up on certain things, certain patterns. I started experiencing synchronicities and things that were kind of just confirming that I was going along the right path. And then doors started opening up. And then, like I said, I fell in love with writing and the writing was really something that was um, helping me navigate the whole process of what I was going through. Um, so, yeah, that that's I think that was the main thing for me. It was making that shift of getting to a place where I could actually trust myself. I could actually go within and I could actually experience the divine presence that has always been there. And the problem was, you know, I was in a system that was always telling me that I can't trust myself and that my heart was deceitful and wicked. And so, you know, I was afraid and I was timid to actually practice meditation and these different practices that bring you into that inner stillness, bring you into that kingdom consciousness that Jesus even says, you know, the kingdom of God is within you. So, yeah. And then the journey um, really started for me at that point. Yeah. The kingdom consciousness. That's yeah. Cool. Yeah. Do you feel as though there is a natural sense of creativity that comes from this? Oh, absolutely. Um, yeah. I mean, once you're, once you experience the inner transformation, and you transcend the ego and you're living from the heart space and you're allowing the divine flow to flow through you, uh, that's when you start to activate this creator energy. Because if we are divine, I mean, what does it mean to be divine? Well, it means, number one, that you have power within you and that that power is life force energy that creates. Mm -hmm. And so, like, for example, if no matter what I'm doing right now, whether I'm writing something or creating content or working with people, if I'm in my headspace and I'm operating from ego, there's a lot of resistance around it. And I feel like um, I just, I know intuitively that something's off. But as soon as I take a deep breath and kind of rest in the witness, the one that's just always there, always present watching, that is when I can literally feel the Tao flow through me. Mm. And I know that there's this greater source, this higher power that at the, at the deepest level fundamentally is me. It's not yeah. something separate from me. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, it's like the more I'm getting out of the way of my own mind and, and the headspace and the ego and the perfectionism and, the anxiety and caring what other people are thinking about me, that's when I'm at my best and that's when I can create at a very high level. And, you know, it's what Jesus said. Jesus says, hey, uh, everything I'm saying, 
is not me saying it. Everything I'm doing is not me doing it. It's the father in me. Mm -hmm. Same, same concept. Julie, it's a um, sense of self-empowerment, real power. And it's not power yeah. over others, right? It's right. like you said, power to create. If we're saying God is within, well, what is God? God is the creator. And if it's within you, then you become a creator yourself. Co-creator, absolutely. Co-creator, yeah. Yeah. I like to say we're like a, an instrument or a paintbrush of God, right? Beautiful. Yeah, that's exactly right. Yeah. And um, it's not like, it's not like um, in this creator aspect, we abuse it either. It's like we surrender to this force and let it create whatever it wants <laughs> and it is yeah. us it is us as you described like it is us at a greater sense but i'm saying like the the paintbrush of gary is used according to how i was born the dharma that i was born with sure. you know in the circumstances my genetic makeup it's used effectively to ultimately create the kingdom of heaven without I would say yeah. we find it within and then we create it without. Yes. Do you say that is like um, what happens in this creative effort is that we, through our just God-given abilities, create a better world altogether? Yeah, I, you know, I think, and I'm glad you brought that up of the sequence of going within and then from that place of awakening within you go without you go into the external world because that's i've always found it really interesting um since the first time i read it but in the gospel of thomas jesus says or before i go there in the, in the bible in the canonical gospels in luke 17 21 jesus says the kingdom of god is within you and then he kind of leaves it at that all right mm -hmm. But in the Gospel of Thomas saying three, it's like the same passage. He says pretty much the same thing. He says, the kingdom of God is within you and it's outside of you. In other words, it's non-dual. But the mm -hmm. sequence of it is you go within, you experience it for yourself, you're transformed. And then once you discover the light of life, then that light of life within you starts to illuminate the external world around you. And so, yes, that is absolutely, absolutely the sequence um, and I do think that, you know, I'm really, I'm glad you, you brought up this question because this is something that I've wrestled with for, uh, some time because I've heard people say different things. And I, I would honestly love to hear your take and your opinion on this, but I've heard some people say in the spiritual community, they say, you know, oh, this, this earth realm is a, is an earth school, which I believe, you know, there's a curriculum here for the soul's evolution. But what they say is that, Things here will never get better uh, because this this planet, this this earth school is created to break us and to cause us to, to learn all these, you know, lessons of all the things that we go through. And um, I get what they're saying. And to a degree, like, I agree with that, but I approach it from a non-dual perspective. And so yes we come here to learn yes we come here to evolve and grow and i think there is an element to this planet to this earth of it of it always being there's always going to be suffering it seems like to a degree because of uh duality right like this is the world this is the plane of duality um and as long as you have two you'll have two sides of the spectrum you'll have the positive and the negative but i also think that while we come here to get something out of this curriculum for our own soul's journey and development and evolution, we also come here to awaken and then to, after we discover our true self, our authentic self, then from that place, we can start to bless the world around us in a unique way that no one else can. Yeah. through our authenticity and that's really where our power is our power is directly connected to our authenticity and so we start to bless the world in a way that no one else can and i do see a collective shift in consciousness like i, I do see th something that 
it, it, it may feel like it's two steps forward, one step back sometimes. But I think we can look back in history and I think we can all agree that while things are by no means perfect right now, there's still a lot going on, a lot of chaos, a lot of disharmony, a lot of dysfunction. We do see a progression. We do see the light becoming brighter um, at some level. And so, yeah, I, I look at it, I look at it both ways. Um, but then part of me, I don't think it's ever going to be this utopian society. Again, as long as we're in this realm of duality, you have to have both in order to understand the other, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. So, but yeah, I, I would love to hear what you think about that question. Well, I agree with you. I see both perspectives. So it's hard to, it's hard to say. Um, I do believe if this is earth school, we can all graduate. Yes. <laughs> and if we graduate, it will be a lot better world. And I think just because it's a better world doesn't mean there's not duality still. Right. I mean, how, how do I put this? My mind says no. My mind says, obviously, that's unrealistic. <laughs> Don't you watch the news? But right. my heart says there is a pull toward a world that is much better, is much better off. And I find that is actually more realistic than what my mind says. And it might take a few hundred years, a few thousand years, but I think we don't always have to be in school forever. <laughs> right. You know? Absolutely. Yeah. And, and you're right. Th these, are, these are big questions and it can be hard for us to fully understand what's actually going on on this side of the veil. Right. On yeah. the other side, it seems like like when people have near death experiences and stuff like that, it seems like they have a lot of clarity on where humanity is, where humanity is going. Um, and I mean, think about it. And just about every near death experience, when they come back, what do they say? They say that they came back because they had some unfinished assignment. Yeah. Right. And so there absolutely is. We all have a reason behind incarnating. And that's why I say, I think it's really good to approach this from a non-dual perspective of, yes, you come here for your own soul's evolution. And there's definitely different realms and different planes outside of this one. But at the same time, you don't just come here to take, you come here to give and you give yeah, by awakening that's it. and allowing the light and the love within you to dispel all the darkness, all the suffering. And mm -hmm. we will see a collective shift as uh, time goes on so yeah 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 honestly man i don't think we will live in suffering and darkness in this sort of hellscape forever because we can both conclude that god is real and god is love so mm -hmm. if god truly loves us more than we can ever imagine why would in his plan his or her plan have us suffer forever right i think the school isn't meant to be in session for eternity we're meant to come here and learn each in our own accord in our own time you could say and then graduate to a better world it's inevitable we have eternity to be able to dilly dally <laughs> right we can put it off as long as we want but inevitably we'll get to a better world and create truly i it sounds grandiose and so woo woo but i think we're creating this kingdom of heaven we are the builders of heaven yeah jesus thought that yeah exactly and i feel it too and i think every sage feels it within when they feel it within themselves you inevitably feel this pull towards something it's a pull through time that lets you know that there is a it's not all just suffering there is a purpose to why you're here and it's to work through your suffering to work toward a better world it's like how else could it be that there's yeah and even if that's delusion right even if we're just talking crazy here I'm fine with it, <laughs> right? It's almost like, that's okay. That's I'll live in that delusion for my whole life, but I don't feel it's delusion, right? That's what the mind wants to say. 
truly, I do think that's what's going on here. But you only feel that within when you go within yourself and you feel that within your heart. Yeah. Well, and the other thing is too, I mean, the way I see it is everyone, every being will awaken at some yeah. point eventually. Yeah. Right. Yeah. That's the whole point of the evolution. And so if every soul, if every being awakens, then what do you think the world's going to look like or wherever yeah. we are, whatever realm, whatever plane, mm -hmm. you know, you know what I mean? So mm -hmm. that's the other thing I think about too. Yep. Exactly. That's part of it. What would this world look like? Ugh alien world it would not look like anything at all yeah. how it looks now yeah it's um it's true man it's hard to see because it's such a dense and thick environment yeah. there's so much drama and noise yeah. that one has to sift through but yeah. truly that's the thing is once you see it and once you feel it within it's um it's easy to lose for sure but it's also easy to gain back with simple meditation, as you described before. All yeah. you got to do is just be still and know. Yeah. And know that that is the truth, is that we are here. If you resonate with this, anyone listening, I know you do, Logan. <laughs> we are here to build a better world. And it's not in a grandiose sense, too. I think you can agree with this. It's not like one person changes the, the whole world. It's right. truly even just like in the small moments of our life and how we choose to respond to all the comings and goings of our life, the people and situations and the drama of our life. It's like how we choose to transform and transmutate the energies of the situation that is um, upheld for us. That's what it's all about. It's just um, in the little moments, man, that might be a cliche, but it truly is. It's like all in the little moments that we do it yeah. and in our work too. You know, I feel yeah. as though, do you feel like, um, I think we might've already answered this, but like when you get on this wavelength, your, your work changes, like your purpose for living, your, um, the way that you want to conduct yourself on a day-to-day -day basis, just flat out naturally changes because you know that this is, uh, this is the truth. Yeah, it does. I mean, especially when I'm working with people and I, I know that what I'm doing, what I'm creating is making a difference in the world around me because like you keep saying that's what it's all about mm -hmm. right and so here's the thing with like manifestation or you know having a desire to create something um you can create whatever you want you can manifest millions of dollars and be the poorest person in the world mm. because if you're trying to create or manifest from this place of not knowing who you are it won't matter. You know, you'll, you'll end up worse off than you were before you had whatever you created. Right. Yeah. Because the whole point of creation, the whole point of manifesting is to go beyond the sense of being a separate self. It's to yep. reveal, it's to show the underlying truth of oneness of interconnectedness. And so when you're coming from this place of, uh, being pure and, and honest, yeah. Uh, what you what you create, like I said, what you what you create will come from authenticity, and in your authenticity lies your unique blessing to the world mm -hmm. in a way mm -hmm. that no one else can can bless the world. Um, yeah, and so that's the way I see it, and it's simple. Like you you work on yourself, you do the inner work, you you have the awakening, you have the transformation. And then you do what you do. You don't That's have it. to have, like you said, you don't have to have this like big plan of like saving the, the world and I have to do all this stuff. And no, because that's, if that's your mindset, then you're stepping into doing instead of living from being. Yeah. And living from being is the key because that is what opens up the door for the Tao, the father source consciousness to flow through you. And, uh, that's essentially what it's what it's all about. Mm -hmm. um, any other way, like I said, it's coming from doing. You're going to get caught up in the mind and the ego. Then you're going to you're going to be worrying about, okay, am I doing enough? And what do people think about me? Yep. And it just at that at that point, you're completely missing what it's all about. And so, 
everything's so similar. It all goes back to what we keep saying, which is you awaken, you discover it within yourself, you allow the source consciousness to flow through you, and you do what you do, but it's not you, the separate self, doing it. It's Jesus said, it's the Father in me doing all this stuff. Yeah, well said. Yeah. Yeah. Now, would you say this is uh, the only way to find true peace and happiness is tapping in to this essence? Because I believe we're all here to be happy, for lack of a better word, we'll say happy. We're all here to be on the pursuit of happiness. Yeah. Do you think there's really no other way than to find it within? Well, the way I look at it is everything that is in this 3D material world is impermanent. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Anything that can be observed, observed is passing. That's why there's that old ancient saying, this too shall pass. Mm. Right. And so if you are attached to anything, any object, any person, any experience, any high, whatever it is, external, if you're attached to that and you're thinking that that thing is going to give you some kind of fulfillment, some kind of contentment, um, you're, it, it's just, that's not the way it is because this too shall pass. That thing is eventually going to move away. Some things hang around longer than others, but eventually it will start to fade away and you're going to be left in that place of emptiness looking for the next thing to cling to to find some kind of happiness or joy or bliss or whatever. Yep. And so God gave us the sky to have that constant reminder with the clouds, right? Everything that we can observe as the subject, as the witness, as pure awareness is moving, it's flowing, and it's impermanent. The clouds, they come, they hang out for a little bit, Hmm. And then this too shall pass, but we are not the clouds. We are the infinite eternal sky that's behind the clouds. That's always there. It's always present. It's pure I amness. And so the peace that we're looking for is actually not just something that is within us, because I think that's not saying it totally accurate. It's not just something within us. It's fundamentally what we are. It is us. And you you can you can say that for anything, whether it's the joy, the love, the fulfillment. The truth of our being is all we need. It, it, it's it's literally the the essence of everything that, that we've been trying to find and search for out there somewhere. And and so you have to rest in that, but the mind will fight you. The mind will say that's not true. The mind will mm -hmm. say that's ridiculous. And the mind will constantly keep you on this treadmill in this cycle, this wheel of looking, searching, and, and, and so on. And so that's why some of the, the greatest mystics have said things like, uh, you are what you seek. Rumi said that. And then St. Francis of Assisi said, what we are looking for is what is looking Mm -hmm. And the method to discover that, for me, the best method has been meditation. I don't think there's, um, and this is just my opinion, there's different methods out there that people have experienced and, and realized this with. But um, for me, meditation has been the, the most helpful for realizing that. I agree. I think with a regular and ardent meditation practice, it becomes quite apparent, <laughs> you know, it's, uh, yeah. it's like, it's so simple. It's almost too simple, but truly all you got to do is just nothing at all. <laughs> it's just breathe and you will be able to see this, you know, the truth is hidden in plain sight and what a yeah. miracle that is, right? Yeah. And when you truly feel that. That is what we are. We're not these bodies, these suffering bodies and everything that comes along with it. We're not all the stories that come along with it. Like truly what we are is actually peace, is actually love at our highest of high essence. Oh. When that hits, that hits. 
Yeah. Yeah. But I will say this, like the, the historical pattern has been, and we see this with Jesus going into the desert, the wilderness, we see this with the Buddha going into the wilderness or wherever he went to sit under the, the Bodhi tree. It's like, there's an element of you have to spend some time alone. Yeah. You have to get away. You have to disconnect. Mm -hmm. um, because that's when you realize that's when you have the experience of everything that I've been searching for has always been right here, right now in yeah. the present moment. The mind is super focused on the past and on the future. And that's where the majority of the suffering that we experience comes from, right? Being attached to past and, and futuristic thinking. But if you're grounded in the now, that is when you start to experience that inner stillness, that peace that surpasses all understanding. And for whatever reason, like I said, historically, we see all these sages going away. The desert fathers in the early church years, like they went to the desert. Mm. That's They connected with nature and they got away from the mainstream and from what everyone else was saying. They got alone and that's where everything started to happen. So I think that's a really important part Um in this whole spiritual journey and and for for anyone who is just starting this journey and they feel like i lost all my friends after my awakening and they they think something's wrong with them and they think that you know they need to like start another religion or or do something else <laughs> you know in order to to fix this feeling as of, of emptiness of of after the awakening like my encouragement to to anyone at that place is no you're exactly where you need to be embrace this time it won't be forever. This too shall pass. So this season of solitude will also come to an end and you'll find other people that are on similar paths as you are, but really sit with and embrace that time alone and, and come to know who you really are, the depths of your being in that place so that you can be centered and grounded from, um, from the witness, from who you truly are. And then you go about your life from that place. So I, I just think that was important to throw in there because that was a big part of my experience. And I see that in many other people's lives. For sure. I think there's a sort of blueprint to the sage. Yeah, definitely. A big part of it is a sense of seclusion. Yeah. You know, disconnecting from the matrix. There's always yeah. been the matrix. There's always been Babylon. So I think... That is the starting point, at least, is to be able to see um, see through it. And the only way you see through it is by turning the vision outward to inward. And sometimes you got to go in the woods. Sometimes you go to the, go to the cave or the desert to yeah. be able to do that. And <laughs> maybe not in the modern sense, literally. I think we can all find our own cave in quiet time. And, yeah. Uh, yeah, that's really all you need to do as a starting point, I feel. And then once you kind of get on that, um, uh, it's like a, a a ritual, right? If you make a ritual out of it, out of finding quiet time, even if it's just five, ten minutes a day, it'll be a part of your life. And this is speaking personally. This is just how it started with me. It'll be a part of your life, almost like brushing your teeth or tying your shoes before you go out the door. Just something that you do. And, uh, yeah. yeah, the hardest part is starting, but once you get it started and you recognize that this is it, I think the Holy Spirit takes over as we spoke of before and, uh, leads yeah. the way. That's right. Yeah, man. Um, yeah, it's quite simple. Like I said before, it's too simple. <laughs> it's too simple. <laughs> we overthink it. Literally, we overthink this whole process and this whole journey, but it really comes down to just disconnect from all the craziness, all the yeah. commotion. And there's a lot. Yeah. There's a lot of distractions in our world, but it just yeah. comes down to, and even this might be a distraction. Who knows? <laughs> At least I'm recognizing it. It's a noble distraction. <laughs> <laughs> Good distraction, yeah. Right? Yeah. And uh, disconnect from all of it and connect with truly the side guru within yeah and if you think about it like that's really the whole purpose of meditation meditation is not about gaining anything it's about losing it's about letting go of all the things that are preventing us from experiencing who we really are and what we already have so 
it's showing us that it it's a lot simpler, like you said, than we think, than the mind is telling us. And this is the hardest thing for the mind to grasp. The mind can't grasp it, but mm -mm. it's literally the now, the eternal now, which is something that every sage, every mystic has talked about. Um, and again, meditation takes you, or it doesn't really take you anywhere. It just, it reveals what is. That's the best way of saying it. Yeah. It reveals what is by removing all the stuff that keeps us unaware of the now and unaware of who we are. Amen. I don't have anything else to say, man. <laughs> I felt like uh, we've said everything we needed to say. And all that I can say is go within. That's really all I can say, right? We can only be a testament or a pointer yeah. for someone to go within. I like to say every true teaching, every valid teaching is really just a guide for you to go back to you. If it's not, then run the other way. It's just another distraction. So yes. Exactly. Great point. <laughs> Meditation. We've said it plenty of times. Meditation, meditation, meditation. And, yeah. Uh, yeah, man. I don't have anything else to say. Do you have anything else you want to leave us on? Yeah, I would just say, you know, the beautiful thing about meditation is that it's completely free. You don't have to rely on anything external. You can do it pretty much anytime, anywhere. And it's, su it's super simple, like we've been saying. So, um, yeah, I mean, my 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 encouragement is if you're on this journey, don't stop asking questions. Stay curious. Mm -hmm. Stay humble. Stay open. Be willing to learn. Be willing to rethink. And uh, know that meditation is the best method to keep you grounded. But don't just view it as something that you're doing that you're practicing you know for five or ten minutes a day view it as more of a lifestyle because when it becomes a lifestyle uh that's when everything starts to change and that's when you notice a difference in your everyday life you know many people have, have said things to me like hey i started meditating and it feels like nothing is happening when i'm meditating and the reason for that is because they're going into meditation with some kind of expectation that meditation is all about some crazy mystical experience or meditation is all about transcendence. And, you know, when you start meditating, anything can happen. You can definitely have mystical experiences from meditation, from getting into these deeper states. And I teach people how to do that. However, it's not just about that. That's just one aspect of it. Meditation is so much more than any kind of temporary experience. Meditation teaches you how to live. It prepares you for life circumstances. And like I said earlier, the whole point of it is letting go. The whole point of it is being detached. Yet, you know, someone might say, well, oh, if you're detached, well, then how do you, you know, love people? How do you go about living from, you know, that realm, from that level of consciousness? And the reality of it is, it's again it's non-dual like you can be detached you can you can live from this posture of letting go but also you're you're coming from love and love doesn't require attachment love is actually the opposite of that it's it's unconditional it's just mm -hmm. giving um and so yeah that's what i think we're all called to and we have the divine potential within us it's just a matter of going within, being still, and experiencing it for ourselves so that the kingdom of God can go from an inner reality to an external reality. And uh, we'll start to see that new earth consciousness start to slowly but surely um, be something present here and now not just something that's futuristic and out there somewhere. No, we'll start to see it right here, right now. Mm. Amen. Yeah. I feel it. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you for coming on here, Logan. I think this was an awesome conversation. You're a wonderful being, very well-spoken. And uh, yeah, I don't have anything else to say. Keep doing your thing, man.
I appreciate it. And thank you for having me on. And I agree. It's a great conversation. Uh, it's always a pleasure to connect with people like you who are like-minded, who uh, are on similar paths. And uh, it, it's uh, we need more of it. So keep doing what you're doing and uh, keep being led by your intuitive heart because the best is yet to come. The best is yet to come. Well said. And you know, you said slowly we're getting there. It might seem slow. But really, in the scheme of things, is it, right? In the scheme of time and all the conversations that I'm having with people and um, just seeing this whole community develop, this sangha develop, I don't think it's as slow as we think. I think it's actually happening quite quickly. Yeah. And you're not going to see it if you turn on the news, right? If you're just doom scrolling on TikTok. <laughs> If you know, first of all, within yourself, and you know who to tune into, people like you, you'll see that um, the revolution will not be televised, and that truly we are living in remarkable times of transformation and change. And uh, yeah, it's not as slow as we think. <laughs> yeah, great point. It, it it totally depends on where you're coming from and what your perspective is, right? But mm -hmm. I, I think I think you're right. I think if we can get still, if we can start to move past all the distractions. Uh, yeah. It's very evident. It's very clear at what's taking place, and we're seeing people awaken and rise up all over the world, uh, which is a very beautiful thing. So, yeah. I, I I agree with that. Well, thank you, Logan, yep. for transmitting your wisdom, and thank you for anybody listening this long. Peace and love to everyone, and peace and love to you, Logan. All right. Thanks again. Talk to you next time. Bye.